start with guilt and shame because um, uh, I think guilt and shame, there's an important difference between guilt and shame, and I think people need to understand because th those terms are used it's used coterminously, and guilt and shame are absolutely not the same. Oh, they're completely different Come things. from different parts of the brain. So why don't you tell me a little bit about it, And because you work with clients with unresolved trauma. So let's talk a bit about guilt and shame, and you well, take the camera. <laughs> I would love to. Um, I would ask that we actually start, before we get into guilt and shame, I think it would be helpful if I could just outline the framework that I use in all of my work because okay. guilt and shame is kind of the next step underneath of that. Would that be okay? Well, sure. Okay, so there's a framework that I use and I work with, let's say, the schema, which actually means pattern of trauma story belief. And this is core to everything that I do. Okay. And so the way that I understand trauma is they're big T traumas, let's say a car accident and you're six months old and everybody in your family dies, you're the only survivor, Ooh. or a small T trauma. Uh, your mother hurts your feelings. And then there's every kind of trauma in between. So if the child is experiencing a traumatic event, then that is a trauma for the child. Nobody gets to define it for the child but the child itself. That being said, if a traumatic event occurs, immediately the brain, as I understand it, makes a story. <gasps> what just happened to me about myself? What does it mean? What does what just happened mean to me about myself? Then we have a story. So let's use Susie. Susie's at school all day. She has her little group of friends. For some reason that day, they're really mean to her. And all day long, Susie wants to run home to mommy. Mommy, mommy, she gets home. Mommy's gonna make her feel better. Mommy is a good object. Mommy is the source of light and love and life. Mommy, mommy. And mommy says, Susie, can't you see I'm busy with your little brother? Don't bother me, go outside and play. And Susie is, oh, what just happened? What Susie doesn't know is that her little brother has been very ill all day long. And mommy's been frantic, terribly afraid that the brother was gonna get dehydrated, terribly afraid that they might have to go to the emergency room. But none of this is translated to each other. Susie doesn't know. So right away the brain goes, what just happened to me and what does it mean to me about myself? And here we go into story. Here's the story Susie begins to uh, develop. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe mommy doesn't love me. Maybe lo mommy loves my little brother more. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe if I was somehow not who and what I am, I would have gotten my needs met. So there must be something wrong with me. Here's the story. Left unhealed and untended, that story over time becomes a belief. I'm not lovable. And it tracks back to, I didn't get my needs met. Mommy loves my little brother more than me. I'm not lovable. So when I work with trauma story belief, mm -hmm. I look at value, worth, and lovability, because that, as I understand it, is literally the wound structure of all of us, the value, worth, and lovability, which, yes. Uh, well, no, it's, uh, and what, what uh, is so interesting to me is that the child doesn't have the ability or is not checking it out with the parent to disconfirm. Mm -hmm. So the, the child takes on that, that affective wound, then that belief, and that becomes who they are. Yes, and right, that's never identity. Gets, and that's the identity. Yes. And th that wound, I, I call it an affective signature because the signature is always the same for each individual. Uh, they have their, you, own, their own unique signature. In this case, her signature was her belief system yes. and the wound that she can't talk to anybody, that she has to take this on, and that she's not good enough. Yes, it's always that. I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, there must be something wrong with me. It never isn't that. That's always where this kind of schema or pattern goes. In every addict, in every individual with toxic shame that I've worked with over the years, I'm not good enough is the central theme. Mm -hmm. I'm just not good enough. Yes, there must be something wrong with me. So then kind of moving back to shame and guilt, I had a client a number of years ago. Uh, I, this woman was, I think she came to me when she was 15. She was a meth addict. And she had been born into a Russian family, very poor, parents not married, mom highly depressed, partnered with a, a low-level member of the Russian mob who was very violent and alcoholic. So mom, it appears, had postpartum depression. The father was gone much of the time, would come home, get drunk, and get violent. The child was very much left to her own devices. One, two, three, really depressed, sleeping, checked out mom. And when the child got hungry, the mother would tell the child to make itself a sandwich. A three-year-old cannot make itself a sandwich. Now, a six-year-old can make itself a sandwich. But the three-year-old who would be hungry with a depressed and checked out mom would try to make itself a sandwich and would make a mess. 
The mother then would shame, blame, and consequence or punish the child for not being able to meet an expectation that was inherently unrealistic. Absolutely. And so then the child starts to feel literally ashamed of itself. Shame, as I understand it, is personal. It is in my very being a not rightness, right. an unlovability. That's toxic shame. We mm -hmm. all have shame, but the kind of shame that we carry is always shame of the other. Yes, and that's the trauma wound. And that's the trauma that's wound. That's the toxic shame trauma wound. And without it being resolved, right. you know, if you don't resolve trauma, you can't resolve shame. Toxic shame. Uh, that's right. And that has to be debriefed and it has to be expressed. Mm -hmm.